All right, what's up, guys? We are back again. It's your boy, Squat Papa, the father squatter. Kind of like a two-for-one video today. I had a question in my DMs about what supplements Gifted Performance myself and Gifted Performance as a whole recommends. And then I also... Full disclosure, I'm kind of lazy, so I want to have this video to reference back to. So when people ask, or my clients ask, hey, why do you recommend this specific supplement? I can just reference them or send them to this actual video. So we will add timestamps in the description of the video for each one of the supplements that we recommend. So this is going to be an evidence-based look at the billion-dollar supplement industry. Um, if you want clarification on any other supplements that are not answered or that, that are not covered in this video, I recommend that you check out examine.com. Kamal Patel has put together a fantastic resource over there. All right, let's jump into it. So this is going to be part one. So we're going to do the tried and true. We've got a little bit of a mention of part two at the end. Part two is going to be uh, the, the malarkey, the myths, and the money sinks in the industry. So the stuff that you may have heard about, but it's really not worth the money because either one, the evidence isn't there, or you're being misled and the evidence actually shows that the supplement is doesn't help at all. Buckle in. This is going to be a little bit of a longer one. I recommend that you go and grab some coffee. I'm drinking, uh, I believe this is New England blend, and it's a... Uh, it's a nice cinnamon and hazelnut. Notes of hazelnut in there as well. Uh, it was BOGO at Publix. All right, let's get into it. So the first ones that we are going to cover are the king and queen, whey and casein. So whey protein, what is it? So we, we know, or, or you should know, that whey and casein protein are milk-based proteins. So if you do have an aversion to dairy, skip this section because both whey and casein will tear you up. But what actually is whey protein? So whey protein, when you separate out milk, you get a water-soluble component and a solid component. The water-soluble co component, when you filter it out, is actually what we call whey. And what we can do is we can take that liquid component and process and concentrate it down into the powder that you see on the shelf at GNC Vitamin Shop, wherever you, wherever you get your supplements from. Now, the level of processing that goes into your whey is going to dictate a couple things. Number one, it's going to dictate price. If you've ever shopped for whey protein before, you know that or you've seen that your concentrates are on the cheaper end. Your isolates are on the more expensive end, and then your super isolates or your hydrolysates are even more expensive. And that's just because each level of processing filters that protein further and further down so that in your scoop, you're getting a more concentrated dose of protein. In a concentrate, you might only get 18 grams of protein in a 30 gram scooper. Whereas in an isolate, you may get 24 grams of protein per 30 gram scooper. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, still getting over something. So you're, you're, you're paying for what you get in terms of the protein, but also what you're getting in the more isolated forms is a lower calorie content. Because as you concentrate the protein, what you're filtering out is a lot of what else that comes with milk your fats and your carbohydrates. So your isolates may have the lowest calories and the highest protein. So if you're in a dieting phase where your carbohydrates and your fat macros are a little bit lower, but you still need to get your protein intake in, the whey isolates may be a better choice. Whereas if you're in a massing phase or a weight gain phase, the concentrates can be a good bang for your buck because you're still getting a good amount of protein and you're getting some additional calories from carbohydrates and fats. Now, whey protein, just like any animal-based protein, is what's called a high-quality protein, meaning that it provides the full amino acid spectrum. Whey protein is extremely rich in leucine, so you will hit that leucine saturation point and see a large spike or a maximal spike in muscle protein synthesis, granted that you are supplementing with enough whey protein. So what's casein? So casein would be the solid that's left. So when we, we filtered out our milk, we had a, a liquid component, that was the whey, and now we've got our solid component, or what's called casein protein. It's 
also used in the process of making cheese. It's where we get curds. So again, just like with whey, you can get casein in different concentrations or different levels of isolation. And what's gonna change there is the amount of carbs, fat, and protein in a fixed serving amount. So with your more concentrated um, forms, you're gonna pay a higher price, but you're gonna get more protein per serving and possibly less calories as well. Just like with whey, again, it's an animal-based protein, so it is going to be high quality and well-absorbed, plenty rich in leucine, so you get all the muscle protein synthesis you could need, but you are going to be left with a slower absorbing protein, and we're going to talk about that actually on the next slide here. We'll look at the actual spike in muscle protein synthesis and the duration over which that happens, because if you are familiar with whey and casein, you know casein is often referred to as the slower digesting protein. Uh, some other notes here. When you put whey and casein in your shaker, you will notice a difference. Whey, shake it up, it remains quite thin. Casein, shake it up, it basically turns into pudding in your shaker. And a lot of people have say, well, you know, this is why I drink casein at night. It kind of sits in my stomach, sits rock solid in my stomach, makes me feel full for longer. And we'll kind of talk about weighing casein and their effect on appetite suppression in a little bit. But let's look at this actual spiking. So here's a good chart right here for you of a muscle protein synthesis response in whey versus casein. So what we're actually looking at here is, is, is leucine concentration of whey versus casein in the blood and then time in minutes. So because whey digests extremely rapidly, you get this very big spike in leucine and a corresponding very big spike in muscle protein synthesis, whereas casein is more protracted out over time. So people will say, get your whey in after your workout because you get this big spike in muscle protein synthesis that sets off that, the, 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 the recovery process and then you should have your casein at night so it digests slowly over the night. But what you'll notice is that the area under the curve for whey and casein is quite similar. So when we look at this group supplements with whey, this group su supplements with casein, which one grows more, they grow about the same amount of muscle. The hypertrophic um, response from whey or casein is pretty similar as long as you match for calories and protein. So how much do I actually need to take of each? So how much whey do I need to take? Well, you don't technically need to take any. The amount that you of whey that you need in a day really depends on your protein needs. If you're a client of mine and I say, hey, listen, you need to get to 220 grams of protein a day and you're only getting to eight, 180, and you say, man, I just can't eat any more solid food, then I would recommend that you supplement with 40 grams of whey somewhere throughout the day. After your workout, that would be a good place to throw it. But if you're meeting your protein needs with food alone, then adding extra whey do doesn't offer any additive benefit. You're not gonna grow any more muscle because you added whey in. Now, what are protein needs? Well, moderately, highly active individual. These are any individuals who are resistance training, looking to build muscle, lose fat, any of those goals. You're gonna shoot for 1.5 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. So for a 100 kilo male, 220 pound individual, that means they're gonna shoot for 150 to 220 grams of protein per day. If they're falling short of those numbers consistently, then it may be a time to look to supplement with whey or casein. Because if you see below how much casein, you're just gonna look up at what it says for whey. Don't necessarily need it, but if you're falling short, it can be beneficial. Your single dosage recommendations are gonna be around 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight. So again, we'll use our 100 kilo male just because it's easy, 220 pounds, 100 kilos. That individual would ingest a single dose of whey or casein of around 40 grams. That'll be enough to get enough leucine to where we maximize muscle protein synthesis by saturating leucine. Let's look at some benefits of whey and casein. So fat mass, benefits of supplementing with whey and casein on fat mass. I'm just gonna bullet point each area where this could possibly help. So it has been shown that by putting more protein in the diet above the RDA, which is around 0.8 grams per kilogram, by doubling that and taking it up to the 1.5 to 2.2 grams per kilogram recommended for active individuals, there may be some aid with fat loss. This is partly because of the thermic effect of food going up because protein has that higher thermic effect of food. 
So as long as you control for calories, if protein goes up, that means carbs or fat have to go down. Therefore, you would see a greater total daily energy expenditure. Um, and then there's also the effect on appetite of protein. So protein is highly satiating, so it's going to keep you full for longer, limit that snacking, and decrease ad libitum calorie intake. However, this can really be achieved with any protein source, chicken, beef, fish, it doesn't really matter as long as you're hitting above that RDA or what's recommended in protein, you will see a favorable effect on fat mass. Now, lean body mass is a very similar story here. If we're getting enough protein from the diet, we don't need to reach for supplements. So you will see benefits in lean body mass just by bringing your protein up to that recommendation for active individuals up from that the RDA amount. But that's not because you supplemented with whey or casein. That's more because you brought the protein up. If that's because you used supplemental forms, great. But it's not because of it. It's more of a secondary thing. Now, weight gain. There are some protein powders on the market, these supplemental protein powders that are marketed as weight gainer, and those can assist with high energy demand individuals. So individuals who are on the move throughout the day, they're constantly on their feet, they're always moving around, very, very highly active. These weight gain formulas can actually assist with that. But why are they assisting with that? Because they're basically just a very high energy supplement. It's a shake, you can drink it very quick. It's 1200 calories. What if I were to eat a chicken breast that was 200 calories and then have three packs of Pop-Tarts totaling of 1200 calories? That 1400 calories, is the weight gain formula going to help you gain more weight than the chicken breast and the Pop-Tarts? And it's not, it's not going to, because as long as we equate for the protein and the calories, the weight gain should be similar again. So kind of falling in line with the previous two bullet points, can these supplemental forms of protein and calories help you? Yes, they can, but it's not necessary. Now, muscle protein synthesis. Whey and casein, more so whey, are gonna increase muscle protein synthesis to a higher degree than other protein sources. So because these protein sources, whey and casein, are so concentrated and so rich with leucine, we will see a much larger spike in muscle protein synthesis. However, there is no current evidence that suggests this acute, very high, very rapid spike in muscle protein synthesis offers any benefit. The current line of thinking is that it is more about the 24-hour protein intake than any one spike of muscle protein synthesis from protein intake throughout the day. So if you've got a client, if you've got two twins, let's just say we clone someone, they both need 150 grams of protein a day. One gets it from whey, 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 three whey shakes, 50 grams each. The other one gets it all from chicken or beef or fish or whatever it is. You wouldn't notice any difference, even though the person that's supplementing with whey would see more rapid acute spikes in muscle protein synthesis. The effect over 24 hours would be the same. How about appetite? Protein as a whole is a satiating macronutrient. Protein, fiber, fat to a certain degree because fat slows down digestion a bit. Um, these are all going to be satiating macronutrients. And one of the hardest parts of dieting is actually dealing with the hunger that comes along with that. So can protein powders be beneficial when we're looking at decreasing appetite? Yes, but so again... So can chicken, so can beef, so can fish. So the real takeaway here on whey and casein, they're great, they're convenient, they're quick. However, they offer no additive effect above that which is offered by your traditional animal-based protein um, sources. All right, so that covers protein, whey and casein. We still do recommend those, especially for individuals in the early stages who may be transitioning from someone who, who hasn't eaten enough protein in the past. These supplemental forms can kind of fill the gaps, but again, no additional benefit there. All right, how about that there, cell tech? You feel me? Those who are from the bodybuilding.com forums back in the day, they know about that there, cell tech. But what was the main ingredient in cell tech? It was creatine, the infamous 
creatine. What is it? It's a molecule. It's found in the body, and it's, it's produced in the body from the combination of three amino acids. Those amino acids are glycine, methionine, and arginine. So what does the body actually use creatine for? Well, it's people will tell you it's a high energy phosphate. So it's, it's stored in skeletal muscle to be used as energy. It's another energy substrate within the body. And it's when we're performing high intensity activity, it's the first substrate that the body taps into, especially when we're going all out intensity. If I were to stand up rapidly out of this chair right now and do three vertical jumps, which I'm not gonna do because I gotta work out later, but if I were to do three maximum vertical jumps, I would tap into my body's stored ATP. And then after that, the body would start to use stored creatine phosphate within the muscle to replenish that ATP and use as energy. So is creatine actually found in the diet? Yes, it is. It's found in meat and fish. However, the amount of meat and fish that you would need to saturate the muscles with creatine is such a great amount that it makes more sense to just use the supplemental form, creatine monohydrate, while also um, consuming your normal omnivorous diet. Now, when we get into plant-based individuals who do not eat any meat, they definitely need to be supplementing with creatine if their goals are resistance, if they have any resistance training based goals. So how much do I actually need to take and which form to take? People ask that question all the time. What creatine should I be taking? You go into vitamin shop, they've got 10,000 different forms of creatine. You've got creatine citrate, crealkaline, creatine bound to this, creatine drinks, creatine powders, creatine bars. What do you want to take? You want to stick with creatine monohydrate. It is number one, the cheapest. There's a benefit right there. Number two, the most researched. So if you look at creatine monohydrate, the body of literature, it's been compared to these other forms of creatine and they offer no further benefit over the tried and true creatine. You want to look for on the back, it says that this supplement includes Creapure. So Creapure was the patent from, I believe, the German company um, that patented creatine monohydrate that's used in supplemental form called Creapure. So you want to look for Creapure. Um, so the other forms really get outperformed by creatine monohydrate, especially when it comes to absorption and solubility. So what you're left with is you shake up your Crealkaline or whatever, and what you're left with is this chalky and worthless, chewy, gross. Uh, my fiance the other day said that uh, she had some clumps of creatine left in the bottom of her drink and it tasted like eating a kidney stone. I don't know what that, that, that means, but you're left with this chalky and worthless solution. So it's just like my PR clean attempts. Um, five to 10 grams of creatine is going to be enough for most. People will say, do I need to load? Do I not need to load? It's gonna get you to the same spot. So if you're really, really worried about maximizing your performance as soon as possible, then you do wanna load. Loading concentrations are 10 to 20 grams daily for one to two weeks. That'll saturate the muscle with creatine phosphate faster, but you'll get there with normal dosages anyway. The dosage that I recommend for my clients would be 0.1 grams per kilogram. So again, using our 100 kilo male, 0.1 grams per kilogram, that individual should take roughly 10 grams of creatine per day to make sure that their muscles stay saturated with creatine phosphate to support their resistance training goals. Let's look at benefits though, because benefits of creatine, there it is, Celtic, are actually more than just the performance side. So here on this slide, we've got the performance side. So power output. Creatine is our measuring stick when it comes to supplements improving power output. 12 versus 20% improvement in strength in placebo versus creatine. So a 20% versus a 12% with placebo improvement in strength. That's pretty big. And when we look at power, see that it's a 26% versus a 12% improvement in power output when we compare the creatine to the placebo. So an even bigger improvement there. 
uh, the effect on body weight. A lot of people will say, I don't want to take creatine because it will make me gain body weight. And there's some validity to that statement. So there is actually a strong effect on overall weight gain. However, we have to look at what that weight gain is actually representing. So that weight gain is representing an increase in intracellular fluid because one of the functions of creatine is that it actually draws water inside of the muscle cell with it. Now, how much weight you gain is going to depend on your response to creatine. So how low were you on creatine before? How much can you actually store? And a lot of that has to do with genetic factors. And then how much actual intracellular fluid did you gain? People say, I don't want to take creatine because it makes me look bloated. I heard it makes you hold on to water. But you have to look at where that water is actually being stored. It's being stored within the muscle intracellularly, not extracellularly. So you won't be holding it underneath your skin, you'll be holding it on inside of the muscle, so it actually has a volumizing component to it. In my last contest rep, it was the first time that I used creatine during peak week to, again, volumize the muscle. Did I notice a huge difference? No. Did I notice a difference? I absolutely did. So, and then the second point here, or the next bullet below this kind of goes with that, it will actually improve your hydration. It draws water into skeletal muscle tissue. A lot of people say the complete opposite, it dehydrates you. There's a lot of myths out there about creatine, so do your research. Um, anaerobic running capacity, so any anaerobic um, event will more than likely be improved by creatine just because of the nature of how it's used to rephosphorylate ATP. So sprint performance, repeat sprint performance, throwing performance, jumping performance, any of these maximal anaerobic events, supplementing with creatine will improve your performance. And there is a massive amount of data to support that. Now the improvements are small, but if you've got an Olympic athlete who got the silver medal last year by 0.02 seconds and they weren't supplementing with creatine, can creatine represent a 0 0.02 improvement on their time? It might, it, it, it honestly might. So it's worth it. Now lean mass, people say, I wanna take creatine to bulk up, get some huge muscles. In the short term, creatine will improve your lean body mass, but it's not lean body mass in the form of skeletal muscle tissue. It's lean body mass in the form of stored water within the cell, so remember, the when you get a DEXA scan and it says, this is your amount of lean mass, that scan can't differentiate between what's stored carbohydrate, what's actual contractile tissue, what's stored water. So I throw you on some creatine, put you under a DEXA, it's gonna look like you gained lean body mass, but that lean body mass is water storage. However, creatine will secondhand long-term improve the amount of contractile tissue that you have, or it should, granted your training is what it should be, just by improving your training quality. So it increases the amount of substrate that you have to use as fuel, your training improves, and when your training improves, you build more lean body mass. So direct improvement of skeletal muscle mass? No, probably not. Indirect Yes, probably. All right, so some more benefits here. Effects on fatigue. Well, intercession maintenance of higher level efforts should go up. You should be able to maintain higher level efforts because you've got more gasoline in the gas tank. Your gas tank becomes larger. You've literally inserted more high energy substrates into the biological system to create more work. So this is mediated by an increase in your anaerobic substrate, your phosphocreatine, PCR. And on the opposite, so, so not, not training related here, but reduced chronic fatigue from 90% to around 10% in children and adolescents. So this is a subjective test of children and adolescents who have experienced traumatic brain injury. So we're talking about concussion or some sort of injury to the brain tissue, and we give them creatine, we supplement them with creatine, and we say, how do your fatigue scores improve? And what we see is a reduction from 90% to around 10% of individuals who report chronic fatigue. 
This is a lot of cool stuff that I am not going to pretend to be an expert about, but a lot of really, really interesting stuff coming out about creatine and the effect on brain health. Moving along, next point, same thing, depression. Notable improvements in depressive symptoms. Give someone creatine supplementation, have them take a subjective analysis of their depressive symptoms, they report less of those symptoms. Also, creatine has a synergistic effect with SSRI therapy, which is a common therapy used in individuals suffering from depression. There also is some research that suggests that there is a greater effect in women. So women supplementing with creatine notice a larger drop in those depression symptoms than their male counterparts. Now, am I saying that creatine is an antidepressant? No, I am not. However, it appears from early research that it, one, has a synergistic effect with already existing therapies, and also that it can overall reduce those symptoms. So some promising stuff there as well. Glycogen resynthesis is another one. So creatine appears to have an effect on glycemic control, how well your body regulates glucose, and how well it, synthes it synthesizes glycogen. So it's one of your more effective supplemental options there. It's been tested in athletic populations, minimal effect, small effect size, been tested in individuals with type 2 diabetes, much larger effect on glycemic control there. So again, some more interesting stuff. And then treatment of headaches. So individuals with headaches or migraines that are um, either caused by or a symptom of traumatic brain injury. Boom, again, similar improvements to your fatigue metrics, 90% occurrence down to around a 10% occurrence in children and adolescents with traumatic brain injury. So this is an area that I'm especially interested in looking at in terms of creatine moving down the line. What effect does it have on brain and mental health? All right, moving on, the number one most used drug in the world right here, caffeine. And my question to you is how many carafes, if I'm drinking an entire carafe, is too many carafes? Because today, I've already had two. Can I smell colors? I don't know, but these purple slides smell pretty dang tasty. So caffeine comes in two real forms. You've got your natural form and your synthetic form. The natural form comes from hot bean water. That sounded gross, I, I regret saying that. But it comes from coffee beans, good old coffee. And then there's the synthetic form. 1,7-trimethylxanthine is the most common synthetic form of caffeine that you'll find. Similar effects. I went into vitamin shop the other day, asked for caffeine tablets. She said, we've only got natural caffeine now. I said, what is this bullshit? I want the synthetic stuff. But I settled for the natural and it works all the same. But the synthetic form is what you find in most supplements. So your pre-workout supplements will probably have the man-made caffeine instead of the coffee form. So what does caffeine actually do? Well, it's got a stimulant effect, revs you up, and a nootropic compound. So the nootropic compounds in caffeine, they sensitize the neurons in the brain and they provide a sense of mental stimulation. So they st stimulate you mentally, providing this sense of wakefulness. Synergistically, we have the stimulant effect, which antagonizes your adenosine receptors in the brain, which prevents the adenosine molecule from binding to its receptor. And when adenosine binds to its receptor in the brain, it causes a sedation or a re relaxation effect. So caffeine, the stimulant components in caffeine, literally antagonize sedation or relaxation. They keep you in that wakeful state, not allowing your body to relax. This is also why you wanna avoid caffeine in those hours before bed. It has an effect on your brain. Now, caffeine tolerance is a hotly debated topic. Some people will say um, you can drink enough coffee to where you actually don't have an effect from caffeine anymore. Some people believe that uh, you never really reach this tolerance point. But theoretically, so just, just speaking theoretically here, there is actually a point of tolerance that you can develop from caffeine that you will no longer get any effect from it and no amount of caffeine will actually overcome that point. 
I've never met anyone at that point. I consider myself someone who has a self-diagnosed caffeine problem. I drink coffee. I still get revved up. White Monster, caffeine tablets, five-shot Americano. It still all does it for me. Now, have I developed a tolerance over time to where now I can drink way, way more coffee? Yeah, I probably have. And I do have friends who consume caffeine less regularly that can get away with one or two coffees and get a very, very large stimulant effect, whereas I'm more of a three, four, five, 12, 20 cup kind of guy. Take it for what it's worth. Um, I have seen some people talk about deloading off of caffeine to resensitize the body. All good options. Um, personal preference. If you want to resensitize yourself, go for it. If you want to keep uh, feeding the problem like I do, that's the way you want to go. All right, so dosing my go-go juice. How much do I actually need? So because the response to caffeine is so variable, I can't give you a good number here. All I can say is here's a good starting point, build up from there. So most of the recommendations that you'll read are to start your caffeine somewhere around 100 to 200 milligrams. For reference, a cup of coffee, from Starbucks has around 110 milligrams of caffeine in it. I believe someone can correct my numbers if I'm wrong there. A shot of espresso has somewhere around 80 to 90 milligrams of caffeine in it. So you want to start somewhere in that 100 to 200 milligram range. Go above that, you might have a bad time. Go below that, you might notice absolutely nothing. In your favorite or in your fat burning supplements on the market, your pre-workout supplements, things like that, 200 milligrams is a standard dosage. However, there are supplements on the market, products on the market that have greater than 500 milligrams in a single dose. Bang, Rain, all these popular ready to drink energy drinks, those are all 300 to 350 milligrams of caffeine. The old school red lines, the little ones that came in like the, the crack vial, those had 500 or those had over 400 milligrams of caffeine i believe my mom drank one of those once just about died sound she was having arrhythmias just about collapsed off the stairmaster so be careful if you're just getting into the caffeine the supplement game you could get severely overdosed without knowing it now where does the act where, where does the research sit or when if i sign up for a research study that's done on caffeine what kind of dose am i going to get you're going to get somewhere between four to six milligrams per kilogram of body weight that is the most commonly used um, amount of caffeine in research and that looks at uh, time to exhaustion for aerobic exercise uh, strength performance power output repeat sprint performance you're gonna be close to that four to six milligrams per kilogram range. There's never gonna be one standard dose that they give to everyone. All right, everyone gets 200 milligrams. That's not how the research is done. It's all based on body weight. And there is some data that actually shows a little bit higher. So four or six to nine milligrams per kilogram will result in, a, in the greatest effect on acute strength. So if you are strength training and you want the largest effect size from your caffeine, you will have to go a little bit higher than that standard 200 milligram dosage. You wanna sit, depending on body weight, you wanna sit in that four to nine milligrams per kilogram. So again, if we use our 100 kilo male, that's, uh, that's a dosage of 400 up to 900 milligrams of caffeine in a single dose to have the largest effect size on acute strength performance. That can be a lot. 900 milligrams of caffeine, nine cups of coffee, that, that, that's quite a bit. For the non-initiated, that might result in not a good time. So what are the actual benefits of caffeine? Well, there's a lot your anaerobic running capacity. So you will notice an increase in anaerobic performance, and that's gonna be chalked up to a higher output and an increased time to exhaustion. So your power levels will go up, so your wattage on the bike or whatever is going to go up, and it'll take you longer to fatigue. So therefore, your total work output or your capacity will go up. Power output. So power output and caffeine are, there's an interesting relationship there, and it seems like you need a high dosage of caffeine to actually have an effect on power output. So greater than five milligrams per kilogram of body weight to have an effect on power output. 
And uh, this has been noted in both ergometer testing, so whether that be the rower or the cycle ergometer, um, as well as weightlifting. So if your goal is to increase power output, um, force time velocity, then you want to go with a higher dosage. However, you still want to assess tolerance. Don't just jump in at that five milligrams per kilogram dosage. Now aerobic exercise performance. In time to exhaustion, they both improve as well. Why does that happen? It's probably secondary. It's a secondary effect, and it's due to an increased fatty acid oxidation. So because aerobic metabolism is so dependent on fatty acid mobilization and oxidation, and caffeine has a lipolytic effect where it helps you break down and oxidize fat, um, that will actually improve your time to exhaustion. That's, that's pretty consistent in the research there. Fat oxidation, again, goes up. Metabolic rate, mixed data on metabolic rate. So some data that shows that if you take enough caffeine, it will improve your metabolic rate. But as we get further along here, we're gonna talk about some supplements that actually have a measurable effect on metabolic rate. Because if caffeine does, it's probably a small effect. Training volume, you should be able to do more work. The amount of work performed within a single session increases with caffeine supplementation. And this is something that we can note in anaerobic performance aerobic performance, as well as weightlifting. Your training volume should go up. RPE, so you take someone who is half asleep, have them do a set of curls or squats or whatever it may be, jack them up with caffeine, their rating of perceived exertion should go down or it will go down. And this, this occurs across a variety of intensities. 50% 1RM up to 90% 1RM. Individuals will report a lower RPE when they've ingested caffeine somewhere around that five milligrams per kilogram dosage. All right, there's your caffeine. Now, a little fish oil. So what actually is fish oil? So fish oil is what most people refer to as supplemental forms of EPA and DHA. And these are omega-3 essential fatty acids. Whenever you see essential in front of a nutrient, you just have to remember that it means that the body cannot synthesize it and it must be uh, attained through the diet. So EPA and DHA, words that I'm not even going to try and pronounce because I'll just destroy them. I'll leave those up to our um, our resident smart guy, Hector Paez. But these are omega-3 essential fatty acids. They're found in fish, animal products, and plankton. However, the best, most concentrated, most bioavailable forms are going to be found in fatty fish. So things like salmon, trout, sardines, herring, things like that. So what do vegans do for fish oil? Well, they have the option of supplementing with algae oil, but it has been demonstrated that these plant-based forms of omega-3 fatty acids have a lower bioavailability, not by some massive margin, but it is a non-negligible difference in bioavailability. Um, if you want to hear more about this, Jeff Nippert had Kamal Patel on his podcast where they talked about vegan diets, and he discusses this in length, the bioavailability of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. So what are the major roles in the body? Uh, inflammatory response. So the inflammatory cytokine response to all sorts of malarkey that happens in the body. EPA and DHA play a very important role in that. Various metabolic signaling pathways throughout the body as well as brain function. This is one that's big for future research in terms of looking at brain health and the effect of EPA and DHA. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so by the numbers. Again, first things first, supplementing with fish oil is not a necessity. All recommendations from the research say that if you are consuming a moderate serving of fatty fish, four to six ounces of fatty fish, three to five times a week, you that should suffice. That should be enough EPA and DHA, your omega-3 fatty acids, to supply you for the week. However, we always like to cover our bases because even though we all think we eat these amazing diets, we really don't. Stuff falls through the cracks. We, we forget to go pick up our salmon. We forget to eat this. We eat Taco Bell instead. <clears throat> So covering your bases is never bad, a bad idea. Now the American Heart Association recommends one gram combined of EPA and DHA daily. Uh, most research shows that the benefits start from consuming around 250 milligrams per day. 
um, and that's above baseline. So if you take someone who's not consuming any, you give them 250 milligrams, we see improvements in health. 500 milligrams, we see further improvements in health. Up to one gram a day starts to be a little bit diminishing returns, and then it falls off from there to basically no additional benefits after that. What are some concerns, or what's one big concern for individuals who take fish oil is those gosh darn fish burps. If you've ever taken fish oil before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You take it on an empty stomach, you start drinking your coffee in the morning, or maybe you grab your, your drink that you're having, and you let out a little burp, and it tastes like you just licked the ocean floor. It tastes extremely fishy. So what can I do to avoid that? Split up your dosages. If you have to take three soft gels a day, take one with breakfast, one with lunch, and one with dinner, because taking it with food will also help with those fishy tasting burps. If you want the fishiest burps possible because you want people at work to leave you alone, take five soft gels before you leave in the morning. Don't eat any food. And when Karen comes over to your desk to drop some reports on for you to do that day, you just let out a nice belch and you say, hi, Karen, and you just let her smell your salmon breath. That is a great way. Now, there have been some advances in how they actually capsule, but I have yet to find any fish oil where I don't get at least some degree of fishy burp. It just comes with the territory. Um, pregnant woman, there is some important or some very interesting research coming out about supplementing while pregnant with EPA and DHA and the effect on fetal brain development. So the recommendation is that pregnant women increase their DHA consumption by at least 200 milligrams a day. If they are not consuming any fish throughout the week, any of the fatty fishes throughout the week, you want to make sure that they are supplementing with the normal dosage of fish oil of omega-3s as well. All right, some benefits of fish oil. Uh, triglycerides, immediate and huge, uh, I won't say immediate, but acute, short-term, couple weeks you'll notice it, improvement on triglycerides. It's actually one of the baselines that other supplements are compared to when it comes to improving triglycerides. A reliable reduction of 15 to 30% of total triglycerides in individuals with elevated triglycerides. If you have healthy range of triglyceride, it will not bring you into ultra healthy ranges. It will just keep you in that range. Um, depression. So I, I talked about EPA and DHA and the effect on the brain, but it looks like much like creatine, there's actually some promising data in individuals with severe depression. Uh, inconclusive in those with minor depression, but along with your normal depression medication, treatment, whatever it is, it looks like there's an additive effect of supplementing with fish oil. ADHD, another brain health one, reduction in ADHD symptoms in children at around 300 milligrams a day. Not saying it wipes out ADHD, but a noticeable reduction across the board in ADHD symptoms. <clears throat> Infant birth weight. So and the initial data looked like that supplementing with EPA and DHA, your omega-3s, um, just created a longer uh, gestational period. So like the, the, the baby was just inside baking for a bit longer, but more recent data has come out and it shows that regardless of that gestational period and a lower likelihood of premature birth, there is also a minor effect on infant birth weight. So that infant birth weight trends in a positive direction, which can have ramifications later in life. HDL, unhealthy individuals will see a small increase in HDL. HDL is still one of those ones that's greater impacted by exercise and body weight. You get your body weight down, you start increasing your physical activity, and you throw in fish oil on top of that, you'll notice a, a very favorable increase in your high density lipoproteins. Um, brain blood flow and oxygenation. So it also looks like supplementing with fish oil, um, especially for those with low fish intake, uh, will actually see an improvement of blood flow to the brain and therefore greater oxygenation of blood tissue. What kind of, what kind of long-term implications does that have? Um, some theories out there about decreasing risk of 
uh, late life depression, dementia, Alzheimer's, things like that. It's still very early on in terms of what the data represents, but it is promising. All right, here's my great joke for you guys today. Why was Mr. Multivitamin such a good baseball player? He did a great job covering all the bases. I, I don't know. At this point, I, at this point, and when I was putting this PowerPoint together, I just started losing my mind. But onward we go to multivitamins. Uh, so, what is slash are multivitamins? And that's a it's a hard question to answer because if you go to the multivitamin section in Walmart, the grocery store, uh, vitamin shop, GNC, whatever it is, you are bombarded with seemingly fifty different multivitamins. Do I take prenatal prenatal vitamins? Do I take the old people vitamins? What about the chewy Flintstone vitamins? What about the the ones over here for 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 aliens? Which one do I actually take? So there's different dosages brands purported outcomes and target audience so when you are picking a multivitamin we're going the bottom one here choosing a multivitamin what do you actually look for you want to number one choose one that's for your age range so if you are an adult make sure you're choosing an adult multivitamin and then you want to make sure that it has close to the rda for vitamins and minerals you do not want to choose these mega dosed vitamins because exceeding the rda of some of your fat soluble vitamins and various minerals can actually have potential dangers. If you've ever seen the movie Bigger, Faster, Stronger, one of the points that they make in that movie is that more people go to the hospital every year from multivitamin overdoses than they do from anabolic steroids. And, and that is true because if you eat an entire thing of multivitamins, especially the chewies, those, I mean, let's be honest, those things all taste good, you can reach toxic levels of various vitamins and minerals. So you wanna be wary of that. Stick to one that's close to the RDA. Numbers that are like 80%, 100%, 90%. Don't choose the one that's like vitamin C, 400,000%, iron, a million percent, magnesium. You'll never have to have magnesium ever again because then you can actually run into some issues of overdosing those vitamins. So going back a little bit, backtracking, are multivitamins actually necessary? No, they're not. So theoretically, if you are trying to, if you're, if you're eating a balanced and varied diet, you shouldn't need a multivitamin. But even the healthiest of us can reflect on our diet and say, am I really eating all the colors? Am I eating my oranges, my yellows, my reds, my dark purples, my leafy greens? Am I really eating all of that? We can lie to ourselves and say, yeah, I am. Or we can tell the truth and say, hey, I'm a creature of habit. I eat the same damn things every single day. Taking a multivitamin might be a good idea to just cover my bases, especially when we're talking about general population individuals who have a Slim Jim and a can of Mountain Dew as breakfast, zero micronutrients to be found. That would be a good idea to uh, supplement with a multivitamin. Are there benefits if you are deficient in one of the vitamins that exists in that multivitamin? Absolutely. However, you will not get any superpowers from mega dosing your vitamins. The only superpower that you might notice is that your pee turns highlighter yellow as you excrete out all of that perfectly good money that you spent on this mega dose multivitamin. Um, Again, we kind of go back to the cell tech thing. If you were ever on the bodybuilding.com forums, there was a really popular multivitamin at the time. It was called Animal Pack. <clears throat> and people called it the pack piss because you would literally pee out bright, bright yellow because, again, it was one of these multi mega dosed multivitamins. And what does your body do with the extras? It just excretes them, it just urinates them out. So moving along, not a lot of benefits to multivitamins unless you are deficient. Um, if you're consuming a perfectly varied diet, go for it. If not, might be a good idea to cover your bases. Let's move on to a little bit of sleep aids. Uh, melatonin. So what actually is melatonin? Well, it's, it's a non-addictive supplement. So when we're talking about sleep aids, something being non-addictive is really good because when we get into <clears throat> pharmaceutical compounds that aid with sleep, things like Ambien, there's a highly addictive component there. So it's good that melatonin has a non-addictive um, or is a non-addictive supplement. So it helps to get you to sleep and regulate your sleep patterns. So melatonin is 
um, a naturally existing compound in the body. It's secreted by the pineal gland and it is influenced by light exposure. So you shine a bright light in your eyes, melatonin secretion goes down and you are in a wakeful state. The opposite is true when it's dark. So when it gets dark, there's very low light exposure. The pineal gland secretes high levels of melatonin and you go to sleep um, or you should go to sleep. So it can be useful for those with shift jobs or in cases of jet lag. So if you work a shift job and you work at night and you have to caffeinate yourself all night, um, it can be useful to use melatonin when you get home, when the light is shining to actually get an, an, an artificial form or, or, or boost your melatonin levels in your body by supplementing with it to actually help you go to sleep. Also useful in cases of jet lag to where maybe you took off from an area where it was light out, you were stuck in the plane where it was light, all the lights were on and whatnot, the asshole sitting in front of you kept his light on the entire time and was just shining it straight in your eyes so you couldn't get any sleep. And then wherever you landed, it was also light out and you're like, damn, I need to go to sleep. Supplementing with some form of melatonin will boost your melatonin levels in the body so that your body doesn't have to respond or doesn't have to naturally secrete it because it won't because the sun is shining. Um, so certain groups of individuals will have naturally depressed melatonin levels. The elderly produce less. Um, smokers appear to be less responsive to their body's natural production. Um, and late night caffeine or stimulant consumption will decrease or will suppress or will make you less responsive to your body's natural production of melatonin. So how to actually dose your melatonin? Effective dosages of melatonin in the research have been shown between 500 micrograms and 5 milligrams. This means that you start with a 500 microgram dose and you work your way up. So you don't want to start off by slamming yourself with 5 to 10 milligrams. And there are supplements, a lot of supplements on the market that give you 5 or 10 milligrams of melatonin in a single dose. You don't want to start with that right away. You want to slowly build yourself up. Minimum effective dose here that helps with your sleep. And you may have, um, if you ever supplemented with melatonin before and you've taken too much at once, you may actually notice, or you may actually know what I'm talking about here. You fall asleep, you get very tired very quickly. You fall asleep extremely rapidly you have crazy lucid nightmares or cr crazy lucid dreams or whatever it is and then you wake up in the middle of the night and you're, and you're just wide awake um so we, you want to stay away from that start with a small amount and there's actually some research that i've seen that shows that spreading the dosage out is actually the most effective so 500 micrograms at 7 p.m 500 at 8 509 to slowly elevate your levels instead of just, boom, just ramping up your melatonin super quick and just boom, knocking yourself out. Now, how do I actually want to time my melatonin? 30 to 60 minutes prior, if you're going to go with a single dose, if you want to micro dose it, probably micro dose it every 30 minutes, starting about two hours out from bedtime, slowly introducing the dosages over time. Um, it's best to take when you are relaxed in bed. So if you're cooking your late night meal or you're driving home from work or whatever it is don't take your supplemental melatonin then take it when you are relaxed you're in a cold dark room limit your blue light exposure or your bright light exposure um, especially after taking the dose one of the ways to make sure that your melatonin doesn't work is to take your melatonin and then Hop on your phone with your brightness turned all the way up and scroll through Instagram. That bright light coming into your eyes will depress your body's natural melatonin and also make you less sensitive to the supplemental form that you've just taken. So put the devices away, nice and cool. You can read a book if you'd like, um, spend time with your loved one, and just relax. That way, that natural elevation of melatonin will help you fall asleep. So some benefits here, the biggest benefit is going to be insomnia. So melatonin is the number one non-addictive treatment of insomnia in the research. So around a three milligram dosage seems to be best, but you cannot compare melatonin to your sleep drugs or your sleep pharmaceuticals. So comparing melatonin to something like Ambien 
it's apples to oranges because Ambien has a sedation component to it. So Ambien knocks you out, whereas melatonin helps you fall asleep. And the difference there is when, when you are sedated, there's some research that shows that sleep quality actually diminishes. We want to have high sleep quality. We don't just want to be knocked out. Some other interesting stuff here in the research on melatonin. Looks like it actually benefits gastrin secretion, which can help prevent from, uh, can help with peptic ulcers. Pretty interesting one there. Seems like melatonin supplementation has ulcer healing properties. Um, I would need someone who's more of an expert on the topic to explain that to me, but just something I found in my research there. Heartburn, similar, see above. Um, heart Symptoms of heartburn seem to decrease with melatonin supplementation. Again, why? I couldn't tell you why, just something I found in my research. Similar to insomnia, jet lag. <clears throat> if you are someone who travels a lot, a jet setter, if you will. Um, this can help you regulate your sleep patterns. One of the number one concerns for individuals who tra do travel a lot, um, especially those who are traveling to compete and sleep quality is extremely important, uh, can use melatonin to regulate sleep patterns. You do want to, you're, you're going to have to do some front end research on your, on your turn, on your time to find out uh, what your bedtime would equate to in the new time zone and kind of adjust the timing of the melatonin accordingly so you make sure that you're falling asleep and waking up in concordance with what the circadian rhythm when you're moving forward so you will have to do some research and some, some some timing out of some things there and then there's some research on the effect of growth hormone and muscle damage um, small increases in growth hormone especially at night hard to parse out if that actually makes any difference but something worth noting and muscle damage. So it seems that um, melatonin supplementation decreases creatine kinase, our best marker of muscle damage. Um, does that have an effect on increased recovery time? Mm, I'm not so sure, but would that coupled with an increase in sleep quality affect recovery time or increase recovery time or assist with recovery time? Yes, it definitely would. So melatonin, can it be a helpful recovery supplement? I would say yes. All right, so we kind of talked about this in caffeine. We're getting back to stimulant here. Big gun, number one, Mr. Ephedrine. So a safety warning first. So first and foremost, before I cover anything else about ephedrine, it has to be said that ephedrine is a banned substance in most competitive sports. It's banned by USADA. It's banned by WADA. It's banned in the NCAA. It's banned in natural bodybuilding. However, it is still something that's relevant for individuals who want to lose weight. Very effective weight loss supplement when used correctly. But that last part is what people screw up, using it correctly. Now, people who have pre-existing heart conditions should never, under any circumstance, touch this stuff. Because the reason that ephedrine is banned is because we had a number of individuals who had pre-existing heart conditions go outside in the heat exercise after they took a bunch of ephedrine and they passed away tragically so if you are someone who does fit the bill of having a pre-existing cardiac condition or you're someone who even has two brain cells to rub together it would be smart to consult with a physician or an expert before you supplement with ephedrine you also want to check with your governing body if you are a competitive athlete to see that it is banned. If you are competing in sports under a governing body, I'll bet you $5 and I'll give you my Venmo that it is banned. Ephedrine is banned in almost every single competitive organization that tests their athletes. All right, but now we can move forward from the safety warning. I've done my due diligence there. Um, Ephedrine comes from an herb. It's extracted from the ephedra herb. Now, when you do supplement with ephedra, you want to make sure that you are getting it in the form of ephedrine and not the ephedra herb. Because if you are supplementing with the ephedra herb, the yield from that is, oh man, Lyle McDonald's going to kill me on this one. Um, I think it's like 18 or 19% of a yield. So you need somewhere around... Um, a 25 20 to a 25 milligram dose so if you take 
25 milligrams of the ephedra herb, which is how a lot of these supplements come dosed. If they've got the herb in it, it's kind of a way to like circumvent the law. You're really only going to be going to be getting like a fifth of the actual dose that you need. So make sure that you are supplementing with ephedrin and not ephedra herb. Um, it is used as a fat loss aid and it is a damn effective one increases heat expenditure in muscle and fat cells so you all you will see that your body off puts significantly more heat when you are supplementing with ephedrine and this has been shown in the research a five percent around a five percent depending on the individual increase in metabolic rate and that is a non-negligible increase that represents a 100 calorie increase if your basal metabolic rate is 2000 calories would boost you to 2100 over the course of a week, that's an extra 700 calories in deficit, which equates to around a 0.2 pound body fat loss. 10 weeks, two pounds, that's a lot. So your most common use for ephedra or an ephedrine will be found in what's called an EC, you'll hear people talk about ECA stacks, ephedrine, caffeine, and aspirin. So ephedrine and caffeine have a synergistic stimulant effect and the aspirin is used in there because there has been some data that shows that ephedrine can have some of like a blood clotting effect. Um, so the aspirin prevents that. And then it also synergizes and protracts out the stimulant effect. So it antagonizes some of the, um, and I'm gonna butcher this, but some of the mechanisms of the body that downregulate the effectiveness of your stimulants, it kind of puts those off. It kind of antagonizes those. So it protracts out the length that you notice the stimulant effect from the ephedrine, makes it effective through a longer window. All right, how much to go zoom zoom? How do I dose my ECA? So the research has shown that ECA will outperform ephedrine alone. And the data supports this over and over again. Ephedrine on its own is dosed at 20 to 25 milligrams per day, or 25, 20 to 25 milligrams per dose. And you take that one to three times per day. The most common form of bronch or of ephedrine that you're going to find, or what most people use, is this right here. It's it's your bronchade, um, and that can be bought from any uh, store. You just got to give them your license, and then they're going to ask you if you're making meth with it. Nope, just trying to lose some body fat, and I promise to use it safely. And if you don't, it's your fault. Um, you will combine that with 200 milligrams of caffeine, 81 milligrams of aspirin in your ECA stack. So it's common to do 25, 200, 81, one to three times per day. How do I time it? Far as shit away from bed, or you ain't going, you ain't getting no sleep. Um, so it's just like any other stimulant. You want to keep your dosages as far removed from bedtime as possible. You're dealing with more intense stimulants here. So you want to make sure that that's even more of a point. Your example for your three dosages, if you were gonna take three in a 24 hour period, I recommend people start with one and then two, maybe. Three is three is intense. You're too hardcore for me if you're taking three dosages. But if you were going to take three dosages in a 24 hour period, you might take one at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. when you wake up, 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. So stimulant sensitive folks, the ones that drink a cup of coffee and they get the shakes like this, you're gonna to wanna to take it with food so that it doesn't have this immediate boom, empty stomach effect on you. All right, now benefits of ephedrine ECA. Studies looking at weight loss with ephedrine supplementation note a maintenance of lean body mass with a reduction in fat mass. What does that mean? It means that in the studies that look at an ECA stack, individuals that were able to maintain their lean body mass, so water, glycogen, most importantly muscle, while also losing fat mass means that you are the weight that you are losing is coming from fat it's not from lean body mass as noted on the first slide secondary to the stimulant effect so let's say i take caffeine my metabolic rate might go up a small amount so secondary to that stimulatory effect or the stimulant effect on metabolic rate we see a further increase in metabolic rate that has to be attributed to the ephedrine or the ECA stack. It's not just this stimulant effect. Now, body weight, we'll see a reduction in body weight. Um, with ECA supplementation, weight goes down, and it looks like from the previous um, notes that the research is showing that that is accounted by, um, or is accounted for by fat mass. 
blood pressure and heart rate. So these are the ones that when I say, if you have a pre-existing cardiac condition, do not take this stuff. I am dead serious about because blood pressure and heart rate will absolutely most certainly both go up with ECA supplementation. So if you already have pre-existing hypertension or pre-existing tachycardia, supplementing with this stuff is a terrible idea because it will make it way worse. So if you have pre-existing conditions, avoid it. Skeletal muscle breakdown has shown that decreased muscle breakdown in a caloric deficit. So there seems to be a muscle protective effect of this ECA stack. This is why it's so popular with bodybuilders. And appetite, our last one. If you know, you're hungry, drink a cup of coffee. What happens to your appetite? It drops off. So there is this effect or this is this relationship between appetite and stimulants where when stimulant intake goes up, we see a de decrease in appetite. So if you are someone who knows, man, I get really hungry every day at 11 a.m., 2 p.m., those are my two windows where I really, really get hungry, it can be beneficial to dose your stimulants or in this case, your ECA around those times when you get your hunger pangs so you get this drop off in appetite or this drop off in hunger at that point in your day so be strategic with it but those are your benefits of ephedrine and eca right there now the last thing that we are going to go through here is my honorable mentions and what i call my effect size questionable group these are ones that i think personally have an effect how big is that effect? Probably not as big as the price tag. So with things like pre-workout supplements or pre-workout formulas, you are essentially paying for the caffeine in there. And you're paying a very large upcharge because I can get 200, 200 milligram tablets of caffeine for $10. I can get 30 servings of pre-workout that have 200 milligrams of caffeine in it for $40. The caffeine is what's doing the actual work. The other stuff in the pre-workout supplements I'm not sold on and the research does not support. So your beta alanine, your citrulline, um, betaine, all these other things that you find so frequently in pre-workout supplements, you're getting a big price tag on potentially something that's probably just caffeine and creatine. So, uh, 200 milligram tablet of caffeine and five grams of creatine will run you less than a dollar. Your pre-workout scoop, probably three or four dollars. Just not worth it. Same thing goes for like your bang, your rain, those kind of supplements. What you see in those is plenty of caffeine, underdosed everything else. You're basically just paying for a really cool can and some caffeine. So I'm not sold, or I think that the effect size is small, not worth the price tag. Moving right along from left to right here, we'll go with glutamine. So glutamine is one of those amino acids that everyone thinks will make them big, buff, and strong. And it will not do that because that's not its effect in the human body. Glutamine simply does not have that effect on muscle tissue. What glutamine can be good for is improving the lining of your GI system. So some data showing that those with GI distress can benefit from glutamine consumption as it improves the health of the intestinal lining. And it's also a conditionally essential amino acid as it plays a role in the immune system. So when do I recommend people supplement with glutamine? You feel like you're getting sick, then it might be a time to supplement with some glutamine because you may be a little bit low on glutamine or what's called glutathione, which is important in the body fighting off disease, infection. A lot of the research on glutamine has been done in three populations, those with cancer, burn victims, and it's been used in endurance athletes who train in extremely high volumes and have higher risk of upper respiratory infections. Any research that's been done for individuals pursuing hypertrophy or fat loss, glutamine, no benefit. Moving along, weight gain protein powders. If you're someone who has a terrible appetite, this stuff can be beneficial, but again, the price tag doesn't justify the benefit. You're basically just paying for some whey protein concentrate and a metric buttload of dextrose powder in there. 
you can buy those two ingredients separately for a lot cheaper than the formula together. Or you can do what a lot of my clients do is they buy their favorite cereal, their favorite sweet treat, whatever it is, Pop-Tarts, cereal, cookies, something that's very high in carbohydrate, lower in fat, and have that with a whey protein shake or a chicken breast, egg white, something like that. You're basically going to get the same thing for a much lower price. But some people swear by this stuff. Fiber supplements. Fiber supplements can be beneficial. Again, especially things like uh, insoluble fiber or soluble fiber like, uh, like psyllium husk. Um, those kind of supplements can be beneficial for those not getting enough fiber in their diet. But you should be eating majority fruits, vegetables, whole grains, things like that. So you shouldn't struggle meeting the fiber recommendations based on your gender. Women should shoot for somewhere around 20 to 25 grams per fi of fiber per day. Gentlemen shoot for 28 to 35 grams of fiber per day. If you can't get those numbers from fruits, veg, whole grain, just really struggling to get to that point, fiber supplements can come in and fill the gaps. Joint support supplements. Uh, this is things like glucosamine, conjointing, MSM, um, uh, shark cartilage, uh, collagen supplements, collagen plus vitamin C. The last two that I listed there have actually showed the most uh, promising data in terms of joint support or joint health. The collagen plus vitamin C, especially prior to training, I've seen some convincing data there. The others, it's a complete wash, a mix of data. You've got to take it for six months. It has a small effect. It doesn't help these individuals. These individuals can't benefit from it. So joint support supplements are still kind of up in the air right now probably not worth the price tag for what you actually get out of it. Probiotic supplements, prebiotic supplements, another one that you're probably better off ingesting prebiotic fibers in the diet because that'll have a greater effect on your gut health than just taking some random supplement which has X, Y, and Z bacteria in it, hoping that bacteria survives all the way through to where it needs to get to and praying that has an effect on your gut health. I'm not sold. I'm not sold on that. And with the data that exists on gut health right now, saying that probiotic supplements are going to improve someone's gut health is a real, real hot take. And I'm not ready to make that hot take yet, especially for the amount that people have to pay for it and the inconclusive data. <clears throat> BCAA is another one. The only individuals that I recommend taking BCAAs, and it's actually EAAs that I recommend over BCAAs, is my clients that are vegan, that I know are not getting um, a large amount of the high quality complete proteins in the diet, then I may recommend that, hey, with each meal, I want you to take five grams of EAAs. And again, it's another one that just covers the bases. Last two here. Um, TUDCA and N acetyl cysteine are both supplements that have been shown to, <clears throat> TUDCA specifically, has been shown to assist with individuals who have elevated liver enzymes. NAC is just a general antioxidant in the body. So for someone who may have a, a lot of oxidative stress that they're placing on the body, NAC may offer some benefit. TUDCA, if you've got elevated liver enzymes or you're taking something maybe that's illegal that is boosting those liver enzymes, things that are hard on your liver, TUDCA can benefit with that. But as with all of these, I recommend that you do your own research. If it's a price tag that you personally can say, I'm okay with this. I know that the effect size may be small, but it's an effect that I'm willing to pay for because it's something that's important to me. Cool, go for it. But I personally do not recommend any of these supplements to my clients as one of the things that I like to do for my clients is save them a little bit of money on their supplement bills every single month. That's all I've got for you guys today. I know that was a long one. So if you made it all the way to the end, thank you for sticking in there with me. Um, if you have any supplements that you would like me to clarify for you, you can always find me at Gifted Performance or at the underscore squat father on Instagram. Just DM me your questions. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I will be glad to answer those. I'm always answering questions like that. I never leave a DM on red without, unless it's something really creepy. No, you can't buy my socks or my underwear. Um, but I never leave these DMs on red without answering your guys' questions. Um, as always, if you are support or if you are supportive of what we do at Gifted Performance, you can always sign up on the website. It is thirty dollars a month, and you get access to fifteen of our 
highly tested, verified, effective training programs. The website will calculate out your, ma your macronutrients for you, whether your goal is massing, cutting, maintenance, aggressive, conservative. It'll give you exactly what you should eat, and then it'll allow you to actually plan out a day of eating with a variety of food choices in the meal planning feature. The website also tracks your PRs and your weight, your body weight, over time and how it changes. So head over there, sign up, try it out. You get your first two weeks free, so it is completely risk-free for you. Let us know what you think on that. We've got Gifted Performance merch on the website, the storefront. Go to giftedperformance.com slash store. You can buy some of our t-shirts. Um, let everyone know that you are a fan of Gifted Performance. Visit the coaches page. If you are interested in some one-on-one -on -one coaching, powerlifting, CrossFit, bodybuilding, posing, we've got physical therapists on staff. We can handle any of your needs. That's all I've got for you today. As always, subscribe, like, comment, the things like that. I'm going to leave you with that because the video has been long enough. I've been rambling long enough, taking up enough time of your day. I'm just going to leave you with one thing, and that is to stay gifted. See ya.